Hello and a warm welcome to each and everyone present here for this session today. Yesterday, we had a successful day one of the Upstream Ahead Summit, and we are all very, very excited for day two today. And I would like to welcome all the eminent speakers, all the eminent personalities here today, and everyone from the audience. A huge, huge welcome and looking forward to day two of the Upstream Ahead Summit. So now today we start off with the spotlight session. Uh, where we're going to speak about the financial challenges faced by the upstream industry. Uh, I would yes. like uh, yes, yes. Uh, I would like to welcome the chairman of the session, Sri N K Singh, Secretary OIDB, a 1987 batch Indian Forest Service officer of the Gujarat cadre senior bureaucrat. We welcome you, sir. I would also like to uh, welcome the uh, esteemed panelists. Shri Ranajit Banerjee, Head of Department of the Hydrocarbon Exploration and Licensing Policy Department of the Directorate General of Hydrocarbons for India. He is also responsible for the periodic licensing round bidding for the exploration acreages under the HELP and implementing the Open Acreage Licensing Policy Program. We welcome you, sir. I would also like to welcome Shri P. Ilango, Managing Director at Hindustan Oil Exploration Company. In his career or of over 28 years in upstream oil and gas sector, Ilango has held several leadership roles in different areas of the business and is a recognized leader in the Indian industry. Last assignment was as the Chief Executive Officer and whole time director of Kane India Limited. I welcome you, sir. I would also like to welcome Sri Rakesh Agiwal, a CA, CS, and CWA with over 25 years of progressive experience in finance and operations management, international expansions, driving profitability, cost control measures, regulatory compliance, and overall financial stability within startups and global million dollar organizations. We welcome you, sir. I would also like to welcome Sri Deepak Mahorkar. He is a partner with PwC and oil and gas industry practice of the firm, starting his career with the Indian Navy as a short service commission officer. During his 32 years of professional career, he undertook consulting, marketing, commercial, sales and operations functions in petroleum, distributed power generation, utilities, and marine industries. We welcome you, sir. I would also like to welcome the co-chair of the session, Sri A.R. Patil, ex-executive director of finance in ONGC. He has worked for 34 years in ONGC in the areas of accounting, taxation, budgeting, financial analysis, and project economics. He is a chartered accountant and a cost accountant. We welcome you, sir. Now, may I please request you, sir, A.R. Patil, to take over the session. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, madam. Uh, good morning to all uh, uh, eminent uh, participants of this uh, session. Our session is the financial challenges faced by the upstream industry. And now, the financial challenges uh, are multiple. First of all, this uh, industry itself is a very uncertain industry, very risky, high capital incentive, intensive industry. And uh, there is a uh, no finance is available during the exploration stage from the market. So it is a real challenge uh, for uh, undergoing uh, business in the ENP sector. Only the established uh, ENP companies uh, normally enter into the exploration uh, venture. But after the exploration is successful, then there is a lot of avenue for getting the finances. Uh, and even uh, during this uh, contract management also, after getting the contract uh, for uh, uh, getting this uh, blocks, uh, and there are a lot of contextual issues. So all these uh, challenges faced by the industry in raising the finance uh, and then managing the finance, then the economics uh, of the uh, projects and uh, then contact management, all will be dealt with in this session. So I first I invite uh, Mr. Ranjit Benerji to start his uh, topic. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Patel. Uh, 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 a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, my respects uh, to uh, Mr. Singh for chairing the session. Uh, I would uh, 
I, I'm thankful to the organizers for inviting me to speak on this session. As a former banker and a consultant, I would love to speak on this just with a caveat that I would speak on my personal capacity. Uh, my job description uh, describes uh, what I do. So it's slightly beyond my current uh, uh, engagement with DGH, but I'm sure uh, I will try to set a macro context of what, uh, what we do. Uh, uh, envisage as the key challenges and the insights and my industry colleagues, Mr. Ilango and Mr. Uh, uh, Agiwal, uh, I'm sure would take it forward and give their industry perspectives uh, of the issues. Can I request the organizers to upload the presentation that I, uh, that I have? Yeah, uh, is the presentation visible, I guess, uh, to everyone? Yeah, we we can we can proceed uh, with with the with the slide. Uh, I would uh, try to be. Uh, it's a very complex subject of financing. Having been an oil and gas banker for about uh, six seven years with leading banks of India, I will, I would I can vouch for the fact that it's a very very complex subject. The complexity is much more uh, than uh, what was captured in this presentation. I will just try to set the context. Let us first understand what is the ENP activity chain and, and uh, uh, why we want to describe the chain. I will come to it later. It starts with the licensing round where at, at present I'm involved in. Uh, you award the licenses, then the process of getting the permits are uh, undertaken by the operators or, or the contractors. Then you carry out seismic operations. The financial commitments are uh, for a typical project, 10, 20 million dollars, typical offshore project. Then you do the exploratory drilling. Uh, uh, if you make a discovery, you uh, trans, uh, 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 you transmit, uh, you you uh, go to the next step of doing an appraisal program, which again involves drilling, delineation drilling, again in, in the range of 30, 40, 50 million dollars of activity. Uh, then you do the evaluation, that is the appraisal, which is the technical term. And after that, you submit your development plan, and suddenly you have a jump in your financial commitment, jump in, in multiples of 10, 20, 30. Then you do the development work where the entire project, maybe a, a project with an exploration budget of uh, 10, 20, 30, 100 million dollars, or maybe 200 million dollars, suddenly gets into a three, four, five billion dollar project in the offshore context. In the onshore context, you, you can also uh, have similar multiples. <clears throat> Then you have a development phase of 25 years, 20, 25 years, depending on the reservoir life. And then you have a phase of abandonment, site restoration, and leaving the project uh, and going away, exit. Uh, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Just to uh, understand uh, why, why the challenges are there in the industry uh, in, in terms of financing each phase, unlike uh, say a solar project or a road project or a power project, where the development phase and the construction phase risk profile is clearly understood and uh, uh, remains, uh, uh, remains uh, uh, the same over the life of the project in terms of the understanding of the risk by bankers or financiers or investors. The risk profile of a, of a, a upstream project dramatically varies between the exploration phase the development phase and the production phase. As, as I described, most players are from the industry, though un they understand what the phases entail. But the risk profile, the understanding of the risk, the inherent risk of the project dramatically varies and, and, and between these phases. And uh, uh, that is the key challenge that is faced in financing these projects. And I would try to come up with some conclusion as, as to the way forward on them. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Let me elaborate slightly uh, on 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 uh, how the uh, how the industry perceives uh, of uh, uh, the, the the risk profile. The exploration period is the is the period of the greatest uncertainty, and a true exploration project is is a, is a wildcat uh, exploration well. Chances of success, as we discuss endlessly, are one in six, one in ten, one in five, one in fifteen, depending on what category of basin you are in. What is the previous track record of uh, appraisals in that and that basin? It's a dramatically low return on investment if you take individual projects by by itself. It is it is the period where you have to carry out the seismic work, limited investments, 
uh, with uh, with very uncertain uh, return, almost like a, almost like going into a casino. Then we have a commercial discovery. The commercial discovery is the phase where where the risks dramatically reduce. However, they, they are not reduced to an extent that we think that it, it is uh, after a discovery, unless you have carried out an appraisal, unless you have carried out an FDP, uh, where you freeze the costs, unless the production profile is visible, and uh, not, uh, not the least, especially in, in the context of India and the Northeast, where you have uh, the need to put in place the uh, marketing and evacuation plan, and need to evacuate the, especially if it's gas. Uh, you the challenges of marketing are immense. So all, when all these all these uh, pieces of the jigsaw puzzle start falling in place, the risk starts uh, getting reduced, and the value, that is the financial value of the project, starts getting established. Next slide, please. <coughs> The development phase is the phase where perhaps it becomes uh, what lenders, uh, financial community is comfortable with the project uh, for the simple reason that the reserves are now producing and the reserve characteristics are, are understood much better in a sense that the certainty of the P50, the P90 numbers get established. You get periodic reserve reports, you get periodic uh, 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 updation of what the productions are. The costs are almost now certain, especially in the conventional context. Uh, unconventional is slightly different. Unconventional coal bed methane, but uh, that's more like a manufacturing play. The, uh, the field matures, uh, and uh, you can carry out regular assessment of the project's viability going forward. And the lenders, uh, especially international lenders, have immense capability to understand development period projects, and are and the appetite to fund them are are are, are is there. <clears throat> and the value of the property now comes closer to its full potential, and uh, and uh, as and when it depletes, its value declines. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Then uh, the last, the terminal phase is the redevelopment phase, which you uh, are, we can call it enhanced production. We can call it uh, in whatever manner that the uh, uh, that the policy dispensation, dispensation and the investment dispensation calls it. But it's the last and terminal phase of the project. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and these are uh, these are for the sake of uh, record the illustrative cash flows of the project. Uh, which uh, clearly brings out the immense amount of uh, risk that goes up front with the huge investment in the development project. And God forbid a development project, if it fails, the faith of the investor community, the banking community would be, would be shaken forever, not just for your project, but for, for <laughs> several projects to come. So that is one of the key lessons. Uh, I'll, I'll come to that in, in, in briefly. So this is the cash profile, out, outflow profile, initial outflows, then inflows start and the inflows if the project is is as per professional uh, due diligence is established the flows are stable and then the cash flows decline going forward uh, uh, next slide please <clears throat> so what are the life cycle sources of funding exploration uh, it is absolutely not possible for us to get any bank financing for exploration let us let us understand that our help awards uh, pure rank exploration projects are sitting in that, this phase currently. And these projects, the percentage of equity funding, that is equity, near equity, venture capital funding is the highest. And this proportion of equity funding and the availability of debt funding goes up progressively as the project uh, climbs down the risk curve. And uh, bank funding, uh, in my experience, becomes available uh, post the uh, early, at the early development uh, at the uh, production phase in, 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 in a significant manner. And again, perhaps at the end of the project, when the EOR, IOR projects come in, the bank funding for those kind of projects, and, and that's a learning because we are trying to carry carry out uh, production in our contracts. If those contracts risk reward profile is not properly set, bank funding in, again will not be possible if the risk reward profile is adversely loaded in against the proponent. <coughs> Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what are the financing options? And here I will uh, try to derive and uh, get, get into some recommendations. Venture capital, private equity, uh, plain vanilla balance sheet financing, mezzanine debt financing are very, very uh, prevalent, especially for standalone, small, independent, medium-sized independent operators 
uh, that is explorers uh, in the in the developed markets especially in the us has a very very well developed exploration funding mechanism which unfortunately does not exist uh, in india in any way the venture capitalists are typical uh, is a huge venture capital industry in, in in india private equity in in india but that is focused on uh, the private equities are focused on infrastructure with stable returns solar projects road projects power projects and in it where the nature of risk reward in uh, startups are similar but unfortunately the professional setup for exploration funding does not exist in india development funding in the past i have been involved in uh, uh, several large development funding projects some of the largest uh, i would say where available are available what's the risk uh, and and the uh, typical models are reserve based lending asset based financing and export credit agency credit for funding those projects the appetite is there for the international community to do large projects for domestic bankers to fund uh, medium sized projects however i would uh, qualify it saying that the track record of the indian industry especially uh, in terms of uh, field projects uh, uh, does create a, a, a hangover of of perception risk perception which is not uh, quite favorable and the production period uh, phase involves securitization of receivables that is sales and vanilla corporate debt which again are very very viable very very possible uh, uh, options next slide please <clears throat> production monetization let me just touch on two things it it depends on future receivables if you are producing you should be able to get from the banking community funding against future receivables of your cash flows however independent reserve evaluation evaluation of the development plan capex and future capex and uh, and uh, a conservative approach towards production profile projections are fundamental next slide please <clears throat> some suggestions uh, having having set the context this is only a context setting presentation is for exploration i think the biggest problem the biggest challenge uh, comes in uh, funding for exploration and appraisal uh, i think the time has come for india we have funding agencies for various kinds of uh, bodies uh, for infrastructure for msme for uh, small scale for uh you name it but we don't seem to have any 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 funding or co-funding uh, platform for exploration venture venturing now this is a challenge the challenge is that uh, if you fund only one exploration project it is almost certainly to fail but uh, the approach should be more of a portfolio funding and it should be seeded i i would say by a government agency or or, or a quasi government agency perhaps uh, mr singh can enlighten us if there is any possibility of seeding a venture capital fund that funds either exploration or late stage exploration appraisal projects with a portfolio approach to mitigate risk <clears throat> in in terms of development funding the recommendation uh, the suggestion is that the robust standards of due diligence have to be established for the banking community international lenders have a typically a set of reservoir consultants in their uh, role who go through them who commission international reports to uh, before they fund projects in india i think we have been progressively uh, 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 not being able to uh, enhance the standard of due diligence of our development projects the bankers and I, I having been a banker are extremely uncomfortable having seen some failed or uh, or underperforming exploration projects uh, development at the development stage are extremely uncomfortable with lending development projects if we uh, raise the standard raise the bar of our due diligence i think this will unlock an immense amount of funding especially for discovered small field projects or projects even for the large majors they can undertake they were having uh and these projects have the ability to repay in 2 3 years uh, the money that they borrow and i would request uh, the, this is uh, uh, this is uh, a suggestion that we should engage with the financing community to set in uh, place the standards of development period funding and production uh, uh, period funding based on international best practices and that would be a very very good step uh, forward Uh, towards ensuring that the uh, uh, current producers, even uh, bigger ones, are able to unlock more funding, more funding through these windows, development and production securitization fundings. <clears throat> 
so that is all i have i have tried to set a context of a very uh, through a, a i would say in uh, even by my standards a simple presentation and uh, let me look forward to uh, the other uh, uh, industry experts uh, veterans on their views on this subject <coughs> thank you sir thank you mr benedi a very excellent uh, overview of the financing uh, aspects of the ont sector uh, it was really very thought provoking and very informative and we have learnt a lot out of this the participants so definitely would have got a very good uh, information on this now i invite uh, mr p elengo uh, <clears throat> for uh, Mm, the, the topic on challenges in financial evolution of ENP projects. Please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Patel, and <coughs> ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> it's a pleasure to join the upstream ahead, uh, very innovative model of uh, hosting a webinar. Uh, I was there yesterday and saw a large amount of participation at a very professionally conducted session. I'm really delighted to join with my rest of the colleague and to share a few thoughts on this subject. I saw the profile of the audience is quite mixed. You have students, you have young professionals, and you have veterans uh, from the oil and gas industry. I thought I will focus more on the uh, students and young professionals and share some of my uh, own experience of developing projects and some of the challenges and opportunities in this sector. Uh, can you put the, my presentation, please? As the presentation is being loaded, I was quite, uh, uh, it was very interesting to listen to Mr. Banerjee, my good friend. Uh, I, I, I was really fascinated by one, one word that he used, uh, the word of casino. Uh, it is indeed like getting into a casino, uh, but it's like getting into a casino for a noble cause, not just to make some money or lose some money. Uh, at the end, if you play it uh, long, uh, you, you have the a professional satisfaction of having made some difference to the uh, to your own country uh, to to the areas in which you have operated so that's a, a really exciting part but uh, but the, the, the terminology that you use the casino is really very really interesting and captures it a very appropriate presentation slides please Thank you. What I thought was to uh, really focus uh, uh, is uh, to explain some of the uncertainties of uh, this industry and uh, how I see the need for government to become a risk management partner and uh, what are some of the key factors when you look at developing a project. Uh, I did uh, uh, then wanted to talk about a couple of areas which are very, very keen to attract investment and I thought I will talk a few issues and suggestions. But uh, having listened to Mr. Banerjee, I will skip the issues and suggestions portion and kind of focus on the top three aspect and share uh, some of my re uh, recent experience of developing a discovered offshore field uh, called BAT in, in India, which is in the phase of development. Next slide, please. Uh, the most interesting aspect and something that has uh, fascinated me when I joined uh, 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 in April 1985 uh, uh, as, a, as a marketing officer in ONGC until today is the element of uncertainty in this industry that you get to know everything in only in hindsight. Uh, and this uncertainty at another level is very adventurous. It, it keeps your excitement, it keeps your energy that uh, every day is, not, is going to be a different day. And uh, trust me, uh, this has been my experience over the last 32 years that every there's never been a dull day in the career uh, that I've had the fortune to have both in ONGC, subsequently in Kane and now in HVC. Uh, the reason for that is, uh, you know, it is only at the end of a, a, a field life you get to know uh, uh, you know, how much, uh, uh, when, when you drill a well, only at the end of drilling the well, you will know whether you're going to find oil or gas. Uh, when you put it on production, only when you produce the last barrel, you really know how much you have actually recovered because the predictions vary. But just to give you an example, in Rava field in India, <laughs> initially thought to be uh, 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 capable of recovering about 
100 million barrels uh, ended up recovering over 300 million barrels and still producing. Uh, so it's a very fascinating field in which you really don't know everything you get to know only in hindsight. And, uh, you know, with all our experience, if you ask me a question, what will be the oil price next week or even tomorrow, uh, I won't be able to give you, uh, 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 I can only give you an intelligent guess, uh, but it may, may, may turn out to be correct or not. So, uh, so despite these uncertainties, why all of us uh, 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 stay remind uh, uh, in this sector or in this sector is able to attract so much investment as well as so much of talent. Uh, you get to you get to meet some of the outstanding talent in this sector, uh, both at the regulatory level as well as at the companies level. Uh, that's because uh, this is only sector that where you can go to bed as a child and wake up as an adult. Uh, you know, it, it gives you that kind of an uh, experience of, of, of going to bed as a child and waking up as an adult. Next slide, please. Uh, you, know, I've, you know, having been part of uh, multiple uh, seminars over, over a long period of time and uh, offering suggestions to government and participating in various dialogues in the, in the government at different phases of uh, my career. Uh, the conclusion I really come to, to reach is uh, the government to start thinking uh, itself as a partner in this risk management. I think Mr. Banerjee very beautifully and very clearly outlined the risks involved in various stages of the value chain. And uh, as a policy uh, uh, team, uh, the government to recognize the risk in various phases of this uh, uh, the sector and how it becomes a partner in helping the industry to develop. And the principles are very clear that the oil and gas resources belong to government. And the government needs oil and gas companies and players to find it for it. Of course, what the oil and gas companies bring to the table is uh, risk investment. And what in turn they expect is a, a freedom to sell its, uh, its gas and oil in a market determined environment. Uh, I think India is still on its way to that achieving that status. Uh, now, uh, three things are very important uh, to uh, in which I believe the government uh, can contribute meaningfully and uh, pretty significantly. Number one is to create a, 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 a economic environment, uh, a, a enabling economic environment for the oil field services providers to thrive. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, oil and gas company depends uh, uh, very heavily on the quality of oil and gas service fields, uh, oil field service providers and an enabling environment is extremely critical uh, to ensure that we manage the projects uh, and manage the risk associated with the execution of projects, particularly so in the offshore field. The second uh, part is uh, India has over a, uh, 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 several decades has created a, a large amount of uh, infrastructure both in onshore by and in offshore, predominantly by the public sector companies and recently by the private sector companies. A model in which a common carrier access to these infrastructure uh, certainly helps and reduces the development cost pretty significantly. Obviously, as owners of the infrastructure, uh, they, would, they would have to have a, a slice in the pie. The third is to and this is an area where the government is uh, seriously focused and you can see some uh, improvement, uh, significant improvement over a period of time, is to ensure a time-bound and efficient regulatory framework, whether it is MOHA, MDF, uh, or, or the Ministry of Defense uh, clearances, uh, where uh, the need to recognize time is, uh, time is money in our, in our industry. Uh, these three things uh, would, uh, uh, by the government, would, would really help in uh, uh, avoid managing the risk in this industry and ensuring there is a successful uh, delivery of projects. Next slide, please. Now, uh, this is a slide I want to really spend uh, some more time and really uh, focus on uh, our own recent experience of developing an uh, offshore discovered small field uh, called BAT. 
Now, very interestingly, this is a field discovered by OMGC in Mumbai High. Uh, when you select uh, a field, uh, uh, when it comes for a bidding round, uh, of course, there is a lot of technical studies and assessment takes place. But overall, at a management level, uh, one of the focus should be to uh, not really go after the top rank field. Top rank field always is very, very uh, attracts a lot of competition. So our strategy has been to go for number two, not number one. Uh, so when we picked up the DSF block now, we, 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 we picked it up B80 purely from that angle. But everybody else was focusing on number one field, we wanted to focus on number two field, which is B80. And between onshore and offshore, we, we really determined that offshore would have a limited number of competition because there are limited number of players in India who can really get into offshore development. So that was a that was a strategic thought process to pick up the block. So obviously you do you do a lot of technical studies and to assess the resources and recoveries. Ultimately, this business is about you know what's your best estimate about what is in the pot, right? Uh, so if you have an estimate about a reasonable estimate on what is in the past, then it is about how do you how do you focus on recovering it in a cost-effective manner? Now, uh, between the uh, uh, you know uh, risk and reward. Uh, one of the simple principles that I learned from my former boss, Bill Gamal, is uh, when the uh, when the risk and reward is presented by your technical team, uh, you basically half the reward of half the reward and double the risk. If a project still makes sense, you go for it. Uh, it's a very simple uh, thumb rule because the technical guys are geologists and geophysicists, uh, ge geoscientists get very excited about about the reserves and resources and often forget the commerciality of doing something. The third part is, you know, uh, this industry can can give you a lot of upside and that is why the players get into the sector. But one should be very mindful about uh, in your early stages to focus on how do you minimize and avoid downside. So, the, the, the key to successful development is to go with what you what I would call a base development, uh, which is A, what is that on a bankable minimum basis this field is capable of producing? What is that at, a, at, at your best, uh, uh, at your best effort, how, uh, what, at what cost you have to minimum, uh, uh, have to make investment uh, in development? Uh, what is the minimum cost that will be required to uh, operate the field? So, you, 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 when you come to that numbers uh, to arrive at a at a minimum possible break-even price without bothering about the oil prices, how they will be. Please, please. Uh, we have a chance yeah. now at ten o'clock. So, please. Uh, uh, for example, when we looked at the BAT, we came up with a break-even price that is. Uh, below uh, in, in the range of 30 to 35 dollar per per barrel and when we looked at a, at a reserves which is below 5 million barrels of recoverable but when you come to planning the sur surface facilities uh, you actually plan for success meaning we initially thought this field will produce for about about 5000 barrels of oil based on initial testing done by ONGC but we build the build, we are building capacities to process 10000 barrels of oil so the idea is at a subsurface level, you go for uh, expecting a minimum threshold and at the surface level, you plan for success so that uh, if the field turns out to be better than you expected, which is the case in B80, then you will end up uh, uh, ensuring uh, a, a quite successful uh, development of a project. And when looking at the prices, the, the industry is known, uh, the oil prices are known for its volatility. Uh, but when looking at the prices, uh, it is always important to look at the uh, project life cycle and take your pick uh, that during a, a project life cycle, uh, what would be, what could be the average price that can, uh, uh, can be realized. Uh, for example, uh, Rawa in, uh, in uh, uh, offshore field, uh, the same field has operated at Twelve dollar per barrel, and it is also operated at one hundred and forty dollar per barrel. 
So in a life cycle, we would see this kind of an up, up and down. So when you look at a, a seven-year project life cycle, so you pick pick prizes uh, that would ensure you have a robust development. So the learning is uh, when you get into development, focus on protecting your downside risk. Uh, and I'm sure if you if you successfully do that, the upside risk, the upside potential, will play uh, itself out. That has been my experience over the last 30 years. I thought uh, this was important to share a few thoughts. And I'm not going to the next two slides. Uh, I have another session uh, with the, the panel of common people. I would rather add those using that panel uh, rather than this session. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would really end uh, with the request to Mr. Singh, adding on what Mr. Banerjee uh, said. There is a, a really felt need uh, to come up with some kind of a funding format, uh, particularly in the context of government opening up the sector for small players to discover small field now. I think that the portfolio based approach that Mr. Banerjee was suggesting is excellent. And I know OADP as an agency. Uh, under its, its umbrella, I think it had collected in the past over 150,000 crores of rupees, uh, most of which is bought in the Conservative Fund of India. At least about 10,000 crores is sitting with OIDB and mostly in, uh, in fixed bank deposits. I think that uh, Mr. Singh should look at ways to unleash that financial power to see some new ideas in the sector. I, I just, uh, I will very heartily echo what Mr. Banerjee said there. Thank you. It's wonderful to uh, connect with all of you and also meet uh, some of my former colleagues in this panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Olingo, for a nice presentation. Now, um, I invite Mr. Rakesh Agarwal uh, from Ken and uh, Ken uh, Oil and Gas for contact uh, management with financial prudence. Please be brief because we have a 10, uh, 10 o'clock, we have a HID session where uh, VAPs are participating. Yeah. So good morning all. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Banerjee set up the context for uh, options for the financing and Ilango talked about the uncertainties in the oil and gas. What I'm going to talk about is the uh, contract management uh, in uh, which we have with the government in terms of the PSCs and the RSCs. So if I can just uh, get the slides uploaded. Yeah. So next slide. So as we see that uh, the oil and gas upstream sector is uh, six decades old and uh, the privatization actually started from 1991 onwards. And at present, we have around 250 contracts which are operational with the government. And if I have to give a breakup, so 100 odd are either in the pre nelp or the NELP blocks and 150 have been signed in the last three years under the HELP regime called the OALP blocks or the DSF blocks. So next slide. So the help and the OALP blocks have come out with uh, uh, drastic policy reforms as we see. And uh, what the government is doing is they are trying to bring in uh, uh, improvements in the PSC and the, uh, namely the pre nelp and the NELP blocks as well. And we have seen recently the self certification circulars, the gas marketing freedom. Some more work is required. And uh, one area probably which still requires attention is the fiscal levies, because in pre nelp blocks is the only block which attracts CES. And from NELP onwards, the government had uh, removed the CES. So this currently makes projects under the pre nelp blocks tight for uh, monetizations. So, yeah, next slide. Yeah, this slide basically discusses the pain points and the challenges in our existing contracts. And when I say uh, this slide, this is mainly what we have seen in the PSC blocks. So obviously, the OLP have not yet been tested. So one issue is the, about the timely decisions, because this was uh, talked about in the previous slides also, that the time bound decisions is one of the key factors. And it actually creates a delay in the investment decisions and even uh, uh, implementation delays. So that is one area which the upstream sector needs to work on. Regulatory hurdles, Ilango talked about defense and the environmental obstacles which are there and many blocks have been relinquished because of these reasons. 
there are differences in interpretation of clauses typical example is whether exploration can be carried out in the mining lease area certain contract provisions are ineffective uh, we have a clause call for fiscal stability but not sure how it has to be applied we have seen oil prices going from as low as uh, 25 dollars 20 dollars but how to apply the fiscal stability clause was not very clear then there are absence of standard operating processes so after you sign the contract so it is left to the individual judgment of people as to how to uh, implement the uh, contract provisions say for example a uh, budget line item at what level it needs to be controlled is not clear the role between the operator and the contractor again is uh, there are overlaps in many places there is a lack of clarity in the roles and responsibilities of auditor for example earlier the auditors used to come and do financial audits but now they even challenge the business decisions decisions taken by the operating committee and the management committee of the blocks micromanagement is again a reason for delays in uh, uh, getting approvals and getting uh, implementation done on the ground and while the new rsc regimes are coming out with improvements bringing those improvements into the uh, earlier pscs is a difficult proposition when it comes to amendment of any contractual provisions so next slide and we are as a country we are looking at uh, increasing investments and we have all the said reasons uh, stated on the slide why we need the investments but one critical point is that how do we manage our ex existing contracts effectively is critical to get the new players so we can move to the next slide and one thing we all know that the people whether it is from the company side or from the government side makes a key difference to this uh, entire process so the people need to be empowered to take timely decisions they need to get that interpersonal relationships and uh, th keep things moving on see the bigger picture ability to able to focus on issues and understands the compliance requirements they should be solution solution oriented and um, have a decisive mindset next slide so what my suggestion is that uh, what we can do is that once you sign the contract you also plan as to how you will operate the contract so what are the key provisions which will be required what are who what will be the roles and responsibilities what will be the processes which are required what will be the timelines what would be the templates and how do we organize training so that the knowledge keeps on uh, moving on to the next uh, team or the next individuals who basically look at these contracts you also need a structure in place what systems you will have in place what uh, digital platforms you will apply how you will manage the documentation how will you allocate the resources who will authorize what within the system and what kind of reports are expected in terms of compliances and a periodic review depending on the size of the block will definitely help in generating new ideas and resolving a lot of clarifications next so and the key over here is the communicating the priorities whether it is during the exploration phase whether it is during the appraisal phase or whether during the development and production phase so i'll just show the next slide which basically is a connecting slide to this so this slide basically shows that if you are in the production the base production will continue to decline for us from 7.3 it comes down to 3.5 million metric ton for oil same thing for gas if you add new projects it will help you sustain and slightly maybe increase but the time of the decisions is critical to that and then with the exploration success there is definitely a much more upside as geologist and geophysicist as elang also said that they are always excited to come out with new drilling pro proposals so what we also have on store is that this is what the upside can look like but all this will require a lot of partnership in terms of making those things happen on the ground so next one thing i wanted to talk was about was on the dispute resolution so in these contracts there are issues with respect to the dispute resolution so Uh, the new uh, contract provisions have basically not provided any seat of arbitration uh, outside india so uh, an international oil and company may find it difficult to basically come and uh, sign these contracts uh, with seat of india arbitration as india so probably what is that government can look at a giving an option to the contractor to select a neutral seat so all expert clauses which are there in many of the pscs are ag actually non starter so well do we really need these the dispute resolution committee which was formed a couple of years back 
again it has only representations from the oil companies uh, from the government companies so uh, the government can look at uh, changing the committee members also any time so one of my suggestion is that whether the representations can be there from uh, the oil company as well as from the uh, ministry and uh, they both can have one person as a common person to avoid any conflict of interest enforcing the arbitration awards are also a long run process in india so when the pscs were signed the arbitration was supposed to be the legal remedy so but subsequently things don't work out uh, in terms of how to uh, basically enforce these arbitration awards so avoiding litigation is as far as practical by engaging at the highest level probably between the companies and the uh, regulators and agree to or what we are agreeing to and what we are not being able to agree to i think that is one other another aspect which can avoid us on going for further litigations mr garwala please please actually please yeah last slide only no. next so these are summary of the ideas so in any contract management you need to this is basically a repetition of what i have been saying so one is the understand and analyze these contracts establish the monitoring protocols getting the performance indicators and kpis probably this could uh, clearly indicate as to which direction the contracts is going through ensure the documentation define timelines and take decisions apply standard processes and uh, enable self certification and automation is one area where a lot can be done to basically make effective uh, contract management with minimum government and maximum governance the last slide just has a few quotes from uh, which are relevant for any contract management the beginning of wisdom is to define so you need to define as much as possible to avoid misunderstandings in the contract simplicity is the ultimate sophistication so we should not over complicate our contracts what gets measured gets vanished understand the contract before you sign it and contract is as good as the people signing it so with this i would just uh, say thank you thank you mr agrawal for a nice presentation uh, now i invite mr deepak morpat from pwc for a talk on the financial challenges in the indian sector thank you am i audible is my slide visible okay i assume i am audible yes yes thank you mr singh mr patel ranjit my guru and senior other speakers from the industry amazing session to start i know time is extremely constrained so i am going to kind of fly and just pause on very important subjects risks with exploration industry have been discussed and probably industry knows audience is very learned there have been situations not very uncommon where the national oil companies are looking to raise debts there are so many such situations coming up in international ent market the iocs are looking to reduce their cost of capital in fact it's a rush people are changing financial modes in between of their life cycle and independent ent players are doing amazing job of coming on board with equities with reserves and then looking for even raising equity i was requested by the organizers to present some very innovative tools and also was told that please do not consider any constraints that are there in india and if there are any policy and regulatory changes required they will be suggested to the government so from that context i am mentioning to you some of the experiences that i have had in my own career in financing ent projects the first one i would like to name is the volumetric production payments the asset interest holder that means operators and non operators agree to deliver a specified volume of production which means one needs to know who is the buyer well up front and that buyer will agree to off take the production but fund the development before there is obviously a regulatory challenge in india about this we do not necessarily know who the buyer of our gas is i heard about freedom of marketing and there are few more additional changes that could lead to this but this has become a very popular way of doing it definitely for dedicated wells and definitely for dsfs commodity index bonds is another very popular methodology of doing away with the risk of commodity pricing in exploration production it is not only the risk of striking hydrocarbon but it's also to do with the commodity prices and who better than us in the hydrocarbon sector now in the last one year have seen undulations in such cases the coupon and yield of these bonds change 
basis the price variations in the underlying commodity very established contract formats have been have been used in the industry obviously the cost will be higher but it's an amazing way of financing situations if the risk being seen is of commodities reserve based lending very common as it intuitively seems from the title with very limited recourse to your balance sheets the traditional way of raising debt has been this the company's reserves have been used as collaterals the reserve based limit uh, lending is also with limited recourse and with limited liability coming up for the project specific reserves so this is another way of de-risking your balance sheet and still getting finances there are obviously uh, tags attached to this kind of funding and one can discuss in more details if time permitted Moving on, carrying partner financing is a very common methodology used across the world. In India, we have used both NOCs carrying, NOCs being carried, independents coming in, technology experts coming in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But somehow, over a period of time, this has been the way. I, if if these are to do with litigations, if these are to do with uh, any specific regulations, need to be looked into. But there are some newer patterns coming in in the ENP industry with respect to financing and there are some customer downstream users and upstream service providers who have become very common players to come as a part of getting carried or carrying catastrophe bonds are bonds which are raised typically by insurance companies typically i'm saying it's not always a solution but these are bonds which partially undo the risk that is perceived by the financiers with respect to newer ways of doing ENP. And I'm naming shale, but it's not necessarily alone for shale, where the nomadic way of extracting hydrocarbon suffers from many catastrophes, especially the natural disasters. And there is always an additional coupon rate that is applied to that. But now operators have learned the art of separate, separating or de-risking partial amount of fundraising through catastrophic bonds. The one which we all know is PE investment. It looks to be a mirage for many of the companies. This is also another way of doing, as Ranajit said earlier, the due diligence that needs to be conducted on some such financing mechanisms is of very, very deep level including by the regulators and if that capability is built into us this is a opportunity that can come up now that tsf and specific smaller capital demand projects are coming up in india this seems to be another area which should be exploited by companies in which have come up in india you heard in the last finance budget as to how government is encouraging people to use this there is an additional incentive which has been provided to invit it has not been heard of in exploration production industry as you know in india there is a constraint that the invit regulation only allows pipelines and storages so if not the upstream offshore installations or onshore Christmas trees that yet not are allowed to be funded but there is clearly an opportunity for companies who own pipelines and storage facilities because they also de-risk the offtake infrastructure that you create there is obviously a possibility of the government thinking about going backwards and identifying criteria for, for allowing invites for even the upstream infrastructure that comes up. Finally, multilateral and bilateral lending, raising of debt from multilateral bilateral agencies for upstream industry has gone down significantly. World Bank has clearly defined that we will not fund oil and gas projects. ADB is on the way. USA, JICA are selective. But there is another new hope that has come up is that if there are social programs attached to this, if there are carbon sequestration projects attached to it where depleted reserves are being linked, and if there are additional possibilities of social good getting created, multilateral and bilateral lendings are quite possible. I have personally financed one very recently, and it goes to say that there are ways of getting funds, not necessarily for the full project, but there is possibility of raising for at least part of your infrastructure. I'm done. Uh, I wish there was time for questions, but I appreciate there is a time constraint. Over to Ms. Patel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deepak, for a very brief presentation. Now I request the uh, session chair to please sum up this session. Uh, so before I sum up uh, any questions um, for the speakers, uh, any because we must give chance to the uh, to the participants who are attending this workshop because uh, uh, very good presentation has been done by all these speakers. So before I sum up uh, any question or answer any question from any of the participants 
no so let me just sum up uh, really it was a very great uh, discussion on the subject because we understand that the ent sector in particular requires a lot of uh, government support and the financing innovative financing model to go on uh, if you talk about oidb because many many partners many persons who are attending today must be uh, trying to understand what this oidb does uh, of course the oidb was constituted uh, in 1974 with the sole aim for the promotion of oil and gas sector and uh, the government is collecting the cess on oil not on gas or as you know that in the nelp and the oil the cess is not collected it is only for the nomination and the pre nelp blocks only so the cess is getting collected on a regular basis and it goes to the uh, consolidated fund of india uh, but unfortunately i should say that this fund is not regularly getting transferred to idv initial in the initial ages and the sum fund came and that forms the corpus of idv so now on today we have a corpus of around 11000 crore only and we give finances to the projects mainly in the mid stream and the down stream sector because we get uh, interest it is in the form of loan only of course the loan rates are little uh, low, lesser than the bpl rates and therefore most of the companies prefer the ydb loans and uh, <coughs> most of the loans are in the in the downstream and the midstream uh, projects so this is how the ydb is running but this set is not going to continue for long and i must tell to this group that the ministry is very keen to uh, enhance to enlarge the uh, functioning of ydb and honorable minister of petroleum mr dharmen pradhan ji has already given a direction to uh, to explore the possibility of making a nbfc non banking finance company for the development of oil and gas sector because there is little uh, chance of getting the uh, funding from the government as an equity therefore uh, if we want to expand oidb this is the only way we can think of so this uh, decision is uh, almost i should say taken by the ministry and uh, oidb has already uh, worked on it a, a study has been done by krisil the report has been submitted and we are in the process of submitting to the government about constituting a nbfc for the funding of the oil and gas sector so this is the latest development which i should say i must tell everybody and i will rather uh, I, appeal to all the oil sector partners to just uh, push it because it is very much required we have the nbfc in the power sector we have the nbfc in the uh, renewable sector but unfortunately because of the very rich credentials and very rich rating of our oil companies mainly the national oil companies uh, there was never thought that this need would be required but with the privatization of the oil sector certainly the new players are coming some of the players may be very uh, having very high rating they may, may they may get loans uh, from the different sources but the middle players or the small size players may require some support from the government so this is the background in which just i thought that i must share to you and uh, the presentation by mr rajit ranjit panerji has been really very thought provoking and uh, i am very keen and as an oidb secretary i am very keen to develop this as a venture cap as the uh, once the nbfc is formed how it will revolve of course the more emphasis was done on the medium and uh, this mid and down sector only but certainly the exploration Uh, phase of the E and P sector requires venture cap, venture uh, capital funding, or different models of funding. This is very much required. And if we want that the oil and gas sector must 
this sector requires a solid uh, support by the government and government has to come forward but in this case just i wanted to express my views that our nocs our basically the ongc and while they are in this field so can we think of uh, that they come forward for creating a venture capital why they done why they can't take a leap because they have the experience of this sector and certainly ydb will uh, come in the play so that was the concept and uh, that's why uh the nvfc which has been conceived in the oidb and submitted to the government uh, it has the partnership of the ongc oil and the and the of course oidb and uh, bpcl and hpcl and uh, iocl also so the presentation by mr elango has been very good and he talked about the while fields in different different models and the challenges which we are facing uh, mr rajesh rakesh uh, talked about the challenges in the psc uh, of course the challenges are there and i must tell you that in the last 5 and 6 years if we see the oil and gas sector the challenges has been very uh, in, a, in a very i mean proactive manner it has been resolved by the dgh Uh, friends you will always uh, agree to the fact that the government system has to be very resilient it has to be robust we cannot take decision case to case basis and therefore there has been little bit of uh, lacune i should say or maybe delay because of uh, unless the system is robust the government cannot roll it out but uh, still i feel and i also did an exercise about the challenges which the uh, psc regimes are there how they are facing even in the even in the nom nomination uh, regime uh, because most of the fields have now become mature so there are government has come out with the incentive incentivization for the eor and iur but a lot of challenges are there so uh, mr rakesh very uh, very i mean eloquently discussed about all these challenges but i must tell you that these challenges are being tackled being discussed and to the to the best way this is being resolved at the at the dgs the discussion by mr deepak uh, from pwc of course very excellent very excellent i should say and uh, i will certainly look forward to such type of uh, i mean ideas when we really come out with the nvfc in oidb but at the same time the oil <coughs> company and mainly the national oil companies they have this responsibility to think of uh, innovative financing options uh, in the oil in the ent sector so this is all from my side uh, thanks a lot to all the speakers uh, for very uh, very excellent uh, presentations Uh, but we need to move forward and the enp sector requires innovative financing also. so this is my last uh, conclusion to the whole discussion and the government is very keen to do that so i can certainly tell that maybe in a one or two years we will see a very dynamic financing model and very practical financing model for enp sector uh, specific and that is what i was so thanks a lot from my side thank you sir thank you thank you thank you so now we pass over to the organizers mr prasanjit uh, for next session